You can be seated. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure today to speak in very couched terms because we have a guest speaker who is a strategic partner, despite what you think. He is a guest speaker who is a strategic partner because there are certain places in the world where that's the right thing to be. So if you want more specific descriptions of this, you can ask questions after service. I'd like to introduce uh, Randy Poole on up to, to, to share the word uh, and his strategic efforts as a strategic partner in those places. <laughs> so would you, would you open your hearts uh, to what he has for us this morning? Thank you, Pastor. That was maybe, maybe perhaps the most redundant introduction I've ever received. That, thank you. Well done. Well done. It's, uh, we, we have to use caution in the terminology that we use. I'm thankful for all of you that are in here, but we're also thankful for those that have joined us online and those who may view our gathering at a later time. And so because of that, I have to be careful not to uh, really allude to too many things or too, uh, too specific of things because of where we're serving at and who we are. And so, um, yeah, it just creates some challenges. But I appreciate that introduction very much. Man, it is good to be here. Are you excited to be here? Okay, I am an excited person almost all the time, so I hope that you can pace with me a little bit uh, in just some enthusiasm because today's game day. Today's game day. Seahawks aren't playing, but today's game day. Every, every day is game day, but as a pastor, Sunday is game day, and I love gathering together to see how God might show up, how God might encourage, how God might move, and so I get really enthusiastic about Sunday mornings, and I just want to express how much of an honor it is for me to be here. I know that I've only met a handful of you, Matt and Brian and David and pastor for the first time this morning, and I think I met Mary, that was, is it Mary? Brooks' grandma or great-grandma? Kathy, okay. See, I'm already messed up. I'm going to stop and move on. Uh, met so many. There's a Mary in here somewhere, isn't there? Okay. We just sang about her. Maybe that's what's throwing me off. But it really is an honor, a joy to be here to share just a little bit about our family's journey in saying yes to Jesus, to move to Southeast Asia as a strategic partner. And I hope that through our time together and, and just sharing about our yes, it would be an encouragement to you to walk in your yes as well, that you would be obedient with whatever it is that Jesus is calling you to do. And so I just publicly want to express appreciation, Pastor Mark, for the invitation to be here. It is such an encouragement to travel the country at this point. I could have never dreamed growing up in Medical Lake, Washington, the opportunity to travel to Ohio and Iowa, North Carolina and Missouri and Mississippi and Texas, Washington and Idaho and Oregon and Montana, all to preach and share about Jesus. What a cool privilege that that is that we get to be a part of. And that's just because of faithful partners and friends like you. I want to take just a couple of brief moments and introduce you to the much more attractive members of my family who are not able to be with us today due to just some family circumstances this weekend. But we have a picture thrown up there. Uh, my wife, Annika, in the green sweater. She's often confused as one of my daughters. Um, I'm told I look way older than her. I don't understand. Uh, my wife, Annika, we met when we were in uh, about 12 years old, I guess. So just prior to junior high is when we met at Silver Lake Bible Camp. Her cousin is my childhood best friend. And I remember telling him on that day that I was going to marry her someday. Uh, she lived in a smaller town, grew up as a pastor's kid. Well, then at 19 years old, we got married, and we have been married just over 13 years now. That is hard to believe, um, but it, at 32 years old, we celebrated 13 years, and even uh, about a month ago, my wife had mentioned being married and having three kids, and the lady at the cash register is like, you don't look old enough for that. And it's like, I don't know if we are, but we are. So uh, we have three kids, our oldest daughter on the far right Make sure I'm getting my directions right. Annalise, who is 11, she's a bookworm. She's super intelligent, loves math and science. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, but even more difficult to think about being married for 13 years is to realize that I have a daughter that just went into junior high this fall. 
and, and that radically shifted uh, something inside of me. And just yesterday, friends talking to me about her meeting a boy from Southeast Asia, and I wasn't ready for that conversation. <laughs> Our son on the far right is, or far left now, is Mataniah. He's nine years old, loves all things sports, a very energetic, loves football, loves basketball, uh, also very, very good at math. One of his favorite card games to play is cribbage. I don't know where he got that from. Not me, but he loves it. And then our, our daughter, Natalie, in the middle, who is three, and she just loves dressing up, playing with Barbies and pretending to be mom. And so we're, we're commonly asked about taking our kids to another country. What's it like moving? How do you prepare for that? Are the kids excited? And, and the truth is, it really just depends on the day and the moment that you ask them or you ask us. <laughs> It just it changes all the time as to the emotions and the feelings uh, in, this, in this transition. Sometimes they're excited. Other times they respond similar to how you and I might. They're argumentative. They are uh, angry because our family is grieving, right? Big changes cause us to walk through grief. And so our kids and my wife and I just are kind of walking through a grieving process. It's just natural and something that we have to do. And they ask the same types of questions you and I might ask. Why do we have to go? Why, why can't God send somebody else? Or my favorite one, are there horses in Southeast Asia? <laughs> Overall, the kids seem to be really excited have a positive attitude towards this transition, but at this point in our life, uh, everything's just chaotic. We're, we're in constant change, constant transition, and it's amazing what God is teaching us in this journey, and it really is that. It's just continuing to walk with him and saying, God, I don't understand. I don't know if I can handle this, but in this journey, where everything changes, when you go to Walmart and you want to buy something for the house, and you have to ask yourself, I'm throwing this away in six months. Do I really need to buy this? And it just changes the way that you live life. It changes the way that you think about things. And so the, the, going, the going is exciting. Man, we're dreaming of Southeast Asia. We haven't moved there yet. I visited there for two weeks. But, but we're dreaming about what that's going to be like. We're Googling things and we're looking at all these different uh, foods and animals and places and cities that we, we are excited about visiting and experiencing but the leaving is much more difficult. These will be our last holidays together with our families. There's a lot of change and transition. It's the leaving that's difficult. But can I encourage you and can I invite you? Grab one of our prayer cards. They're on the back table. And would you just commit to praying with us? We believe there's literally nothing. We love your money. But as much as we love your money, because that's what actually gets us to the field, it costs money to go, um, praying really is the most important thing that we could ask that you would be a part of. I invite you to partner with us in prayer. Commit to praying for our family. Commit to praying for our kids. Commit to praying for my parents and my wife's parents. Commit to praying for the people who are about ready to go minister to, that God would do something incredible in this whole circumstance. And I just invite you to do that. Send me a text. Send me an email. We could get you on our newsletter uh, through email, and that way you could follow along with what we're doing. But we really covet your prayers deeply and appreciate them. In addition to working fast food jobs, nursing, construction, we've also been in bivocational ministry uh, since getting married. We've, we've always walked through ministry. And we served as part-time children's pastors, junior high pastors, worship pastors, uh, pretty much every portfolio of pastor you can think of. We also served as the facility cleanliness liaison. Um, I came up with that on my own. Was that good? Uh, we served in those roles in Medical Lake at uh, Lake City Assembly of God, now known as Redemption Church. Most recently, we served as a lead pastors in Clarkston, Washington at Redemption Church. We were the church planting pastors, merged it with a, another AG church, and then led that for four and a half, about four and a half years. And that was the role that we had just stepped down from last year. We transitioned the church and uh, stepped down from that and began pursuing this call to serve overseas. And the Lord just began to stir within our hearts something different, stirring our hearts for change and, and stirring it uh, to call us to move overseas. We really didn't know where that was going to be. 
It wasn't a new concept for us. We, we had felt like the Lord had already planted this within us since about junior high, both my wife and I. So we knew that at some point we would most likely end up overseas, but but this was just the moment that we began to feel like it was time to start pushing forward towards this new role and just exploring what God has for us. This was the time that we began to pray a really dangerous prayer. We began to pray about where we could go. God, where would you send us? Where people who do not know you, where few, if any, churches exist. God, where is a difficult place that you could send us? We didn't feel like God was designing us nor calling us to go to a place where there's a whole bunch of other team members already. But instead, God, where, where is there a hole? Where is there a gap in the great commission that we could step into to reach people who are far from you? And God began to break our hearts for an indigenous people group living in Southeast Asia who are considered never reached with the message of Jesus. We are thrilled, we are nervous, we are anxious, we are overjoyed, but we are honored for the opportunity that God would call us to advance the kingdom of God amongst never reached peoples. Like each of you, I'm following my notes a little closely because there's some really good stuff in here that the Lord gave me. I just don't want to miss it. We simply desire to be obedient. There is, I want to throw something out that I've never, never shared from the pulpit before, but I get this almost every time I step off of a pulpit. Man, you guys are so brave. You guys are so courageous. Oh, I could never do that. You can do it. You can do it. You can go across the street today and you can go share your faith with somebody that you've never met before. You can get on an airplane and you can fly to South Africa and go share the gospel somewhere. You can do it because the power of the Holy Spirit gives you the courage and the boldness to be a faithful witness. There is nothing courageous about the Poole family. It's obedience. It's obedience. It's just saying, yes, I'll go. And can I tell you, we didn't just wake up one day and say, let's fly to Asia. <laughs> the, our yeses started when we were in junior high. When, when we were young and just saying, Jesus, what do you have for me? And beginning to pursue him while sitting in church and, and just listening and, and stepping out. And those yeses have led to this point. But I think for some people who don't have a habit of saying yes. Saying yes to something this big is just too daunting because there's not a pattern of yeses in our life. As we say yes to little things, it becomes easier to say yes to big things. I want to take a few moments and introduce you to the concept of never reached throughout Southeast Asia, and we're going to watch a short three-minute video. And as we watch the video, can I encourage you to pay real special attention? Sometimes it's hard to hear the words coming out through the narrator's accent, but I want to encourage you to pay really special attention to what the narrator says through the video, and listen for the key words used to express the spiritual atmosphere, the lostness of this region of the world. And then I want to come up, talk just a, briefly about the specific area we're going without mentioning it. And then we're going to jump into God's word together. And so let's watch this video. It whispers in the ears of those that believe. It shouts in the streets, straining to be heard through the overwhelming noise. Can you hear us? The collective cry of fallen humanity devoid of a savior. Centuries have passed without hope. We live here, hidden in the far away places. Our land, strange. Our culture, a mystery. Our hearts, empty. Our people cling to anything that resembles truth. But what we seek remains out of reach. Our brutal spirits on the edge of breaking. Our prayers unanswered. Our gods stay silent. We are the never reached. We are still waiting. 
We hear a sound. It echoes in our ears. It wakes us in our sleep. A voice in the wilderness. A message 2,000 years old. A final command. Go. A simple but profound directive from a saving God. With our victory assured, we journey to the ends of the earth. We climb mountains, trekked through jungles, landed on forgotten islands, searching. Many have received, but far too many still remain. Too many haven't heard. Too many don't know. This unfinished task is our urgent kingdom mission. Chosen. Seen. Heard. Called. Can you hear them? Nations. Cities. Tribes. People. They are the never reached. They've waited long enough. There is a sound. Can you hear it? I've had the privilege of traveling throughout Malaysia and northern China and Portugal as well. I tell you, there is something pretty profound about walking through some of these places and stepping into a Buddhist monastery or a Hindu temple or an Islamic mosque. If you haven't had that experience, I encourage you to consider it. Find a way to step into some of those places and see what it's like, the, the lostness, the loneliness. I, I, wonder if, I wonder if, as believers in America, we forget what it's like to live without the peace of Jesus. I think I've been too guilty of taking the peace of Christ for granted and forgetting what it was like to live in turmoil. And yet so many people around the world, here in America included, but so many people around the world live in constant spiritual turmoil. See, the country that, that we're moving to, it's a wonderful place. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's tropical. The people are incredible. The climate is enjoyable for some. It's 85, 90 degrees year-round. The city we're moving to rains about 170 inches a year, but at least it's warm rain, not cold rain. There's 150 varieties of snakes. The most common snake to find in your house, according to Google, is the king cobra. Ginormous saltwater crocodiles. The food is arguably the best in the world. Who doesn't want frog soup? <laughs> That's <laughs> but there is great need for Jesus. Amen. And part of my job as a global worker, strategic partner, is, is not even necessarily convince you that there's more need there than there is here. There's so many arguments, but, but really my job is to just stretch horizon a little bit, to bring back the necessity and the urgency of the Great Commission that Jesus has called us to go. I use caution as I talk about the place we're going to because it's illegal for us to go as M's. It's illegal for us to show up there, and so we have to get visas under some type of different portfolio. It's, it's illegal for us to share our faith with one of the indigenous peoples that are there in the country we're moving to. You see, this country is really interesting because it has a king and sultans who oversee and rule the indigenous people, whereas they have a federal government that oversees all of the foreign. So it's not illegal for my family to be a Christian there. It's not illegal for us to follow Jesus, but it is illegal for us to share our faith with one of the indigenous peoples. It is illegal for one of them to convert from Islam. In fact, they would be committing treason against their country for them to follow anything other than Allah. It said state governments have passed laws making it a crime punishable by fine or imprisonment to induce Muslims to change their faith. You see, though there are several, several fundamental Christian churches in this area, in fact, there's over 750 Assemblies of God churches in this country. They're made up primarily of people who have come from other countries and immigrated, immigrated to this place. 
Yet the indigenous people group represents 14 million people born into Islam and are categorized as this never reached people group, according to the Joshua Project. This means that in the region that we're moving to specifically, there's around 600,000 indigenous peoples. That doesn't even count everybody else that lives there. There's about 600,000 people from the indigenous people group, among which you might be lucky to find 480 followers of Jesus. That's how few are there. It's not necessarily a case of not having Christians because there are many churches, but it is a matter of being difficult because it's illegal. It's difficult for them, and these people would have to give up everything to choose to follow Christ. It makes for a really challenging spiritual culture atmosphere to step into. But you see, this video just introduced us to these people group who wandered through life looking for anything that resembles hope, anything that resembles truth. This is true of many of our Southeast, Southeast Asian countries and cultures where they'll practice Islam, they'll practice Buddhism, they'll practice Hinduism, they'll practice pagan worship, they'll practice forms of animism, and, and they're just engrossed in these different religious practices, but even more than that is they'll practice a mixture of multiple religions on top of each other. I remember being in China and walking into a Buddhist mosque. That's a foreign idea. But, but it's said that in this place, you'll find somebody from the indigenous people group who's a follower of Allah, and yet when their child is sick, they're not going to Allah because Allah's not doing anything. So then they'll go to the witch doctor, and they'll have the witch doctor cast spells over the child and, and say all sorts of chants and burn incense for the child. And then if that's not going to work, they're going to go and they're going to begin worshiping a Hindu god, and they're going to mix all of these different things together, hoping that something works out for them. You see, these people in Southeast Asia walk through life carrying a spiritual backpack. And they just collect things all their life that resemble truth and resemble hope. And they're shoving it in there, hoping that in the end, something inside of this backpack pans out for them. Something in this backpack works out and brings the peace and the hope and the satisfaction that their soul longs for. you know what? If we're not careful, we equate this to cultures like Southeast Asia and we forget that we can do the same thing here. That we proclaim to be followers of Jesus and we worship Sunday after Sunday, but we hold more tightly to what the doctor says about us than what we do Jesus says about us. We allow the enemy's voice in the world to determine our worldview and our cultural perspective rather than the word of God. There's a word that's used to describe this. It's called syncretism, a mixture, a conglomeration of religious practices. Friends, we, can, we do the same thing here. It just looks different. It just looks different. But our family has the privilege of serving as the first workers from our network of churches, the United States Assemblies of God. We're the first family to reside on the third largest island in the world, which is shared by three countries. Not only will we be the first and only for now, but we're also the first family to be serving specifically with the church leadership of this country since 1999. God is opening a fresh door for ministry to take place, and the burden on our hearts is to reach the indigenous people group of the host country. So our family's goal, what we've committed to, is to spend the next 30-ish years working to establish the church amongst the never reached, this ethnic indigenous people group of the country we're moving to. Through establishing relationships, we hope to discover individuals who sense a call to reach the never reached, help them to develop their gifts and their talents so that we can deploy them to plant the church. God is doing an amazing work here. And he's allowing the Poole family to be part of his strategic mission. Together, we can partner together 
to reach the never reached of Southeast Asia. Those 14 million people, a daunting number, so that they can experience the peace that you and I just sang about in pretty much every single Christmas song we just sang, that they have no concept of. What a joy and an honor that we get to do this as we proclaim Christ. This morning, I'm so delighted to have an opportunity to jump into God's word with you today. And over the next hour and a half, I'm just gonna unfold a few things. Just kidding, just kidding. If you have your Bible, would you make your way over to the book of Matthew chapter 16? We'll be starting in verse 21. I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation this morning. And so the words will be on the screen behind me so you can follow along. But I want to jump into our passage today, and then I want to share just a couple of thoughts with you that the Lord has laid on my heart. And this most certainly becomes a M or strategic partnership message, but it's a message for each of us. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 28, begins by saying this, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly, that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter, said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Wow. Wow, what a passage of scripture. I want to share just a little backstory with you. The verse that we just read comes after a question that Jesus asked his disciples in verse 13. Jesus asked them this, who do people say the son of man is? Tell me, tell me, what are they saying about me? And they respond telling them that some say he's John the Baptist, some say he's Elijah, while others say Jeremiah or another prophet. But then Jesus turns to them and asks them this question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? That's what the world is saying, but who do you say I am? This is a familiar passage for most of us that have been in the church for some time. And Simon Peter responds to this question. He says, I know, I know you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus then declares Peter blessed because the father revealed this to him. The climax of this encounter comes in verse 18 where Jesus declares, Now I say to you that you, Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. But the context of these couple of verses reveal how the church is built on the big rock, which was the declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the big boulder. This is the big foundation that Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my rock on the fact that you have now declared I am the Messiah, the one who God has sent. It wasn't about Peter, the little rock. But following this declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, this huge statement made by Peter, Jesus is now foretelling for the very first time to his disciples that he is going to suffer and die. He doesn't specifically say death on the cross yet. That hasn't been revealed. It'll come clear in the coming chapters of Matthew. But it is the first time he says, this is my future. I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter, Peter cannot even fathom what Jesus is saying. How can he? They just established Christ as the Messiah. They've been walking with him for a couple of years. How dare Jesus even speak of such terrible things? And just like any good friend, just like you and me, this is probably the moment that Peter's heart shifts where we see in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane where Peter pulls out the sword. Right? says, you're not taking him. 
There's this shift that takes place, and now Peter all of a sudden becomes the warrior and says, this isn't happening on my watch. I'm not going to let this take place. Peter is gearing up for battle. But look how Jesus responds to him in Matthew 16, 23. Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me, an adversary. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. A stumbling block. The little rock that was just blessed a few verses earlier for declaring Jesus the Messiah has now become a stumbling block to Jesus' mission. You see, there was a problem with Peter. He was thinking like a man. Thank you. You're, yes. I was hoping somebody would laugh at that. <laughs> I wasn't meaning, right, okay. So is a delayed response. It's fine. He was thinking like a man. He didn't have a kingdom perspective in mind. For Jesus and his disciples, this part of the narrative creates a major paradigm in their relationship with Christ. The rubber meets the road, so to speak. The, the disciples have walked with Jesus for a couple of years now, but Jesus is now inviting them to the next level of their relationship and asks them to commit to going all the way to death for his name's sake. The name of Jesus, which is clothed with power and authority. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus says, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. This verse is followed by Jesus' clear invitation in verse 25, that if you give up your life for his sake, you will save it. But you see, the illustration here of taking up our cross is not so much the burdens or the worries that you and I might carry in this world. I know that there's some stuff going on in our lives. Some of you even shared a few things with me before church today. And I'm sure if we went around the room, we can all talk about the junk that's going on and the things that we have to bear, the things that we have to navigate through. But the illustration here is not simply those things, welcome to the fallen world that we deal with stuff, but the illustration is that you and I are encouraged to pick up a cross. And it's not our illness, that's not your cross to bear. Infertility for those of us, those of you women, who have struggled with infertility, that, that's not your cross to bear. Singleness, celibacy, that, that's not your cross to bear. Our infirmities are not our cross to bear for the sake of Christ. Rather, Jesus is inviting us to deny our flesh, our passions, for some even our hobbies, our status in this world. Those are to be crucified in such a way that we are emptied of ourselves. This is where we pull in the Apostle Paul's teaching throughout all of his letters on what scholars have coined as the cruciform life. I want to share just a couple of Paul's verses. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, through 27. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Paul really illustrates for us that, that we are to, to surrender our entire being to him. We're baptized in water as a symbol of crucifixion and coming into a new life with Christ, so much so that we are clothed in Christ. Christ's image, not, not the creation, the Imago Dei, but being clothed in Christ to where only people around us see Jesus in me. That you don't see Randy, you don't see Annika Poole, but it's that you see Jesus in and through my life. That when you look at my bank account, when you look at my hobbies, when you look at my calendar, when you look at my status and my social circle, you see Jesus, not Randy. Philippians 1 through 20, Paul goes on. He says, I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. Paul makes it clear that living means living for Jesus. That Jesus being proclaimed, Jesus being exalted, Jesus being adored is the primary purpose in which Paul strives to continue breathing. 
that if God is going to leave him on this earth, it's for the purpose of Christ being magnified. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we will live So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. This ties right back to Jesus' invitation. He says, I'm going to suffer and die, and I'm inviting you to come with me. Wow, what an invitation. Sign me up. But Paul's saying, through suffering, the pain, the persecution, the things that you and I endure in life, we continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. So what is it that Jesus is saying to us? What might Jesus be asking of us today? I think it goes right back to our Matthew 16 passage. Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus wants us to know that he's inviting us to something that's not a matter of life or death. But he is inviting us to something that is life in death. See, if you die to yourself, you'll experience something that you'll never experience apart from me. But how do we respond? What does this look like? We take up our cross. We choose to follow Jesus. We crucify our passions, our hobbies, our desires, our status in this world, our social circle, our economic circle. We surrender all of that and accept Jesus' invitation to let the rubber meet the road. We have a choice. It's the same choice that Peter had. We can choose to either be a blessed rock or a stumbling block in the mission of God. Don't think like a man. And all the ladies said amen. But be kingdom-minded. Have a kingdom perspective. Warren Wearsby, commentator, notes two approaches to life presented in our text. And he just kind of walks through them. I just want to share them briefly. That you and I have the choice to either deny self or live for self. Take up our cross or ignore the cross follow Christ or follow the world. Keep our soul or lose our soul. Share in his reward or lose his reward. Those are the choices that we have. 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm just paraphrasing this. It's not on the screen. Paul tells us, that all who have had the veil removed, who have experienced salvation, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And that the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. The last verse in our Matthew 16 text, verse 25, reveals that Jesus draws the conclusion of his suffering and death back to his kingdom glory. This isn't a doom and gloom narrative, but rather Jesus is walking himself and inviting us to come with him to this future glory. And this is paralleled in the Paul verse in 2 Corinthians 3. 318, that when we share in Christ's suffering, we also share in his glory. And Jesus is taking us step by step in that, mo- in that movement and in that progress. But Jesus wants to remind you and I today of his rightful place in our life. That Jesus desires to be the center. Jesus desires to be the fulcrum of our life. He wants to be the reason that you and I are breathing today. You and I have the choice to be blessed or a stumbling block. As I think about the things in my life, what time do you normally conclude? At the end. end. I'm wrapping up here. As I think about the things in my life that I've needed to surrender for Christ's sake, it comes back to my key ring. And as I conclude with this illustration, I really conclude with a final question 
or series of questions as a thought. Are there keys on your physical, spiritual, economic, or social key ring that keep you from being all in for Jesus? Do your keys, the things that you have access to, the things that you're responsible for, the possessions in your life, the relationships that you hold tight to, do your keys help or hinder your pursuit of kingdom-mindedness? This morning, my final illustration is I have my heavy equipment operator keys with me. Is there anybody else in here that's a heavy equipment operator? Any construction workers? No one else? Okay, I see fingers. Everybody's shy to raise their hand. I, I don't understand that. I wouldn't say I'm a journeyman. I didn't go to, to training. I didn't do any apprenticeships for it, but I've been in the excavation industry for about seven years now. I was the janitor or the uh, facility cleanliness liaison in Medical Lake mopping floors after a Sunday morning service and board member at the church owns a large excavation company in the Spokane area. He's doing all the groundwork, underground utilities for like the Amazon buildings going in. He was locking up the building and came over, saw me mopping floors, says, hey, what are you doing? You wanna come see what I do tomorrow? So I met him at six o'clock the next morning. He drove me around all these different job sites. I was 22 years old, I think, at the time. And it's like, man, this is incredible. Off-road trucks driving all over the place and excavators and loaders and dozers. And it was fun. It's like, man, you own this? This is incredible. He goes, yeah, how about you come work for me? I'm like, what? I get to do that? So I show up with my pearly work boots and brand new hard hat. If you get into the construction industry, just go scuff them up, okay? Rub dirt all over your hard hat. Don't show up with a pearly white hard hat. I already had a construction background. I just never was in excavation. So let's do it. So I show up and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get the keys to these excavators. I'm going to get keys to the off-road truck. I'm going to get keys to all this equipment. This is going to be incredible. And so I show up to work at 6.30 in the morning and, and they hand me the first tool of the day. Guess what that was? The shovel, the shovel. Talk about how discouraged, man, a, an eager 22-year-old is to be handed a shovel and told, your job is to stand there all day while they dig up a pipe and you just have to make sure they don't hit it with the excavator. Like, you're paying me $22 an hour to stand here with my shovel making sure he doesn't hit a pipe. It was boring. It was boring. Six months later, I was running small jobs on my own. I picked it up really quick, and I started collecting keys. But what I found out was that the keys that people carry were like a resume. The keys gave them access to the equipment. The keys signified to the people on the job site that they had some level of authority or accomplishment to be able to operate the equipment in which they carried keys for. Am I correct? Are you the equipment operator? Okay. To some degree. Otherwise, you have the people that just go buy them all off of Amazon because they think they look cool, right? That's really the opposite, and <laughs> we'll talk about that after church. <laughs> but the keys represented a resume, and two years ago, God began to reveal to me. I was in a time, it was post-COVID, a year after COVID initially hit. I did fine through COVID, but then I started experiencing some depression and anxiety. And in my time with the Lord, he began to reveal to me that I was feeling overworked, I was feeling depressed, I was feeling anxious, I was feeling stressed because there were things in my life that I had taken on as a responsibility that God had never asked me to take on. And I was feeling this tension of, God, I'm trying to pastor the church and I'm trying to take care of my family. I'm trying to lead my staff well. Why is all of this happening? What is going on? And he just began to reveal to me, Randy, you're too distracted from what I've actually called you to do. That you can't be focused. And he began to take me on this journey back to being the intern cleaning floors in Medical Lake. And I thought, man, I was so cool because I collected every key possible in that church. I don't know what it was about churches back then, but they had a different key for every door in the whole facility. <laughs> and I thought it was so cool to have all of those keys. That when somebody needed help, they could come to Randy and they could get the key and I could let them into the closet. If they needed into the janitor's closet, I was your man. Nobody asked for that one. 
If you needed into the children's ministry wing, I could do it. Let's go hang out and play with the toys and the puppets. And that was great. If you needed into the youth closet where all the snacks were, let's go raid it. They got a big enough budget. This will be fine. The women's ministry closet. Oh boy. Forbidden women's ministry closet. I had a key. Just don't tell Kala. I thought I was so important because of the keys that I had access to. I remember buying a granite and cabinet shop at 25 years old. How cool that was to turn the key to the door of my own granite and cabinet shop as a business owner and then as a lead pastor take on a whole nether host of keys. Not just physical, but spiritual and relational. The keys just represent authority or position of responsibility within our life. But you know what? In this journey right now, God is taking us on a process of decluttering. There were keys that I was carrying that God began to reveal to me that I just needed to throw in the garbage. There were keys that I was carrying that God was telling me that there were others that I needed to raise up in leadership and hand the key off to and pass the baton, pass the key to them and give them the responsibility to simplify what I was doing. And now I've been told by multiple other workers who live in other parts of the world that there's gonna come a day where I'm flying on an airplane for our 32-hour flight to Southeast Asia. And I'm gonna begin panicking on the airplane. Begin digging through my backpack, patting all of my pockets, asking, where are my keys? Because right now the pool family is in the process of being stripped of everything. And this isn't a sympathy speech. This is a positional speech. That God is removing us of all of this stuff. My, my tool trailer keys. My Ford F-350 truck that's parked outside. I'm not looking forward to turning that key in. We don't have a house. We don't have a mailbox. My gun safe key is gone. I don't care about the safe. I like the guns. They're all being disappeared. They're, they're, it's, it's all being decluttered. Why? So that Jesus can move us to a position to send us to another country to reach the never reached. And the question is, what keys in your life are keeping you from being kingdom mindedness? What keys in your life? Not all of them are bad. Not all keys are bad. God calls us to carry keys and responsibility. But what things in your life are keeping you from being kingdom mindedness? What things in your life are keeping you from reaching the never reached throughout this area in western Washington? What are the things that God might be calling you to throw away? What are the things that God might be calling you to pass on to somebody else? To simplify and declutter the responsibilities that you carry in life. May I pray with you this morning? Friends, today, I think the challenge is simple. Is there anything worth more than your soul? Jesus invites us to lay it all on the line, to say, have your way in me. And as I think about the things in my life that I've needed to surrender, there's more so that I can be kingdom minded in this. And I simply want to ask, if you're here today and there's something in this presentation that you feel like the Lord is just stirring your heart over, would you simply raise your hand as a response that says, the Lord's speaking to me. He's tugging at my heart today. I see the hands. I, I just want to pray with you. That's it. I just want to pray with you. Jesus, I thank you for Neighborhood Christian Church. Lord, I thank you for these friends, this this family, these brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you would give them the boldness and the courage that as your spirit is speaking to them today, Lord, that they would make the necessary changes in their life as you speak to them so that we together can remain on mission so all may hear. Lord, that as we go into this Christmas season, as we just spoke this morning of the hope that is set before us. Jesus, would we not forget nor neglect the nativity story that you are living out through us as we represent you to the world around us. Lord, help us to declutter our lives in such a way that it represents a kingdom-mindedness. Lord, I know all too well how painful, how challenging that can be at times. So I pray that you would give peace and that you would give comfort to your people as they walk in obedience to you. Help us to say yes 
to whatever it is that you're asking us to do. I pray that you would be with them today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Friends, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Pastor Mark. So, just, in, just before you disappear, would, would you pray with me, uh, not just for the pools and their ministry, uh, but how we as a church can be a part of it? Um, it's a baton that's passed. You know, Christ gave to his disciples who gave to theirs and on and on. And it keeps getting passed yeah. on and on, and it doesn't have to be diluted. As you see, a, a, a strong presentation of gospel truth. So would you, would you pray with me as we thank send them you, out? Lord. So, Father, thank you uh, for Randy you, and for his family and for their willingness. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord God, to be stripped, not... Not to lose, but rather, but rather to receive. Lord, that in our lives, our shelves of our heart get so filled up with peripheral nonsense that has such potential value in our minds, Lord God. But, Lord, you have something better. So, Lord, would you bless their willingness as they go out to be retooled, reshaped, to be made more useful. And that first usefulness is becoming more in love with you, to be willing to be with you, to be friends with you, to be sensitive to your leading, to be guided in, if possible, each step of each day. So, Father, we pray for their family and that they would receive over and abundantly grace and protection and provision as they've said yes, and they're willing to be used to carry your treasures to those who are without. All these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, thank you. So, there's no second sermon or third one at this point. But to leave you with this thought, if you can remember being a new parent, or if you haven't been a parent yet, to look forward to this advice when you say, oh, I just don't know if I'm going to be a good dad, or I just don't know if I'm going to be a good mom. And then some wise soul will turn to you and say, oh, it's easy. Just love them more than life and breath and light, and water, and food. And do that over and over again. And let's flip that on its ear for a second. When you think of your parents, or you have an ideal of what sort of parent you want to be to your children, do you want your children to look back at you and say, oh yeah, dad was a good dad. He loved me more than everything except for work, and video games, and elk hunting, and scuba diving, and garage sailing, and most television between 5 and 11 o'clock. Your father loved you to the point that he gave so deeply for you. Love echoes love. So I think your message was very helpful today that our hearts would be willing to echo that love back to the Father. And in so doing, and only in so doing, do we become qualified to carry love to others. You can't give what you don't have. So let go of what you're holding and receive what He's offering. And then all the doing takes care of itself. So Father, would you, would you send us out to a quiet place where we would connect with you? Would you send us out to a relational place where we could connect with others? And that we would have joy as you carry not only your share of the yoke, but our share of the yoke too. And that some amazing things could happen. Would you tend to those hearts that are aching today with your love?
Jesus' name we pray. Amen.